Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first panel session of today's Growing for Growth conference. Uh, delighted to say that this panel, like every other session today, is full of people who can bring insight and illumination to the topic at hand. And uh, that topic is about the role that business will play in getting our country back on track. Now, taking that, that question at face value, the answer is pretty obvious that business is going to have a huge role to play. Um, but sitting behind the question are some interesting issues and trends, which make the answer a little bit more complicated. Uh, for example, a lot of businesses themselves are struggling right now and whole sectors like hospitality and aviation are under enormous stress. There are important questions to be answered about the regulatory, the fiscal and wider policy approach which the government needs to take to allow those businesses both to, to survive but then also to thrive and to lead the business-led recovery we all want to see. I'm hoping that this session will cover topics like the sorts of businesses that might lead our recovery, how activist the government should be in protecting certain sectors and picking winners, and what the implications of new trends like greater tech adoption and more home working might mean for a business-led recovery. So to discuss these sorts of issues and plenty more, we've got a fantastic panel this morning, each of whom I'll ask to keep their opening remarks to five minutes or so, so we've got plenty of time for Q&A. And if anyone's got any questions for our panellists, please do submit them within the YouTube chat or by tweeting us at, at CPS Think Tank. Joining us today on the panel, we're lucky enough to have the Chair of the Policy at the City of London Corporation, Catherine McGuinness, we couldn't have put this session on without the City of London support, so thank you, Catherine, for helping us to make this happen. Following Catherine, we have the Small Business Minister, Paul Scully, the MP for Arundel and South Downs, and former Business Advisor to Prime Minister, Andrew Griffith, and the Chair of the Centre for Policy Studies, Michael Spencer. And I'll introduce each of them in more detail before asking them to speak. First of all, I'd like to ask Catherine to make some opening remarks. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, it's a real pleasure to join the Centre for Policy Studies Going for Growth conference today and for the City of London Corporation to sponsor this panel on Back to Business. Returning uh, the economy to growth as we recover from COVID-19 is absolutely essential, of course, and the private sector is naturally going to be uh, a driving force behind this. And we at the City of London Corporation, an unusual body which uh, basically not only looks after the square mile itself, but also works very closely with the financial and professional services sector, which carries um, our name. Uh, we've been very active throughout uh, this uh, crisis. Our, our focus has been on supporting uh, the city to help employees, businesses and the financial system sustaining our work on uh, long-term competitiveness, securing the long-term uh, uh, needs um, of the city, not only by making sure that we uh, maintain um, uh, strong uh, business links or whatever for, for, for future trade, but also by actually looking at issues such as um, our own climate action work to make sure that the city is sustainable uh, into the future. And we've also been working to help speed the recovery so that we're ready, whenever the moment comes, to relaunch a full and stronger economy. And uh, over the last six months, the city's Lord Mayor and I have spent time talking to businesses across the square mile and throughout the financial and professional services uh, sector. And we've been talking to them about how they're coping with the virus, how they're returning to the uh, workplace, because they've been working throughout, I should underline, um, uh, and you know, what they see for the future. And we've heard a number of major strands. We've heard how the sector has innovated, both by adapting quickly to make sure that the workforce can work from home, but it's also innovated to help the wider economy through this difficult period. For example, through developing new forms of payment or new insurance products. And despite the obvious difficulties, the markets have held up and remained open, showing the adaptability, resilience and innovation of businesses and regulators alike. And we've seen how some of the technological change which was happening anyway has really accelerated and uh, we've really moved, somebody said to me, you know, five years or a decade perhaps quicker than we might have done uh, other than the challenge of this uh, dreadful virus. But we've also heard besides the, uh, uh, um, the role that innovation has played and uh, the way that that has uh, sped up, we've also heard from many people that a green-led recovery is essential, with businesses across the world recognising that we can't go back to things just the way they were. And uh, firms are looking to build back better, not just by enabling uh, technological innovation, but also by supporting a greener and more sustainable recovery and ensuring that environmental, social and governance criteria are central to investment. 
So the City Corporation is really looking forward to uh, another event which we will be hosting, a Green Horizon Summit in November, when COP26 would have been, to showcase how green finance is fundamental to the recovery from COVID-19 and how to mobilise capital at pace so that the UK can meet its net zero target. And another opportunity uh, that the push for growth gives us is to focus on the government's levelling up agenda. Financial and related professional services are critical to the UK's future competitiveness in many ways. And with two thirds of the roles in the industry based outside London, they're also a really important way to drive growth around the country. We see, for example, innovation and invention being nurtured in small, agile companies um, around the UK. And global firms have increasingly significant footprints in UK cities such as Edinburgh, Manchester, Birmingham, Cardiff and Leeds, attracted by skilled populations, reduced overheads and space to grow and a different lifestyle uh, in the different parts of the, the country. And we uh, here at the City Corporation try to work with the wider sector using the global reach of the City of London to spotlight opportunities across the country to international audiences and importantly to promote the whole UK as an excellent destination for uh, foreign direct investment. So business and the financial services sector in particular has a huge amount to offer at this time when we're really looking to uh, drive the economy to speed the recovery. So the question uh, posed is what can the government do to help this? And I would uh, suggest, uh, I would suggest three uh, points. Uh, first of all, let's look a little bit at that question about returning to the workplace. And we mustn't forget, uh, in particular, SMEs. 99% of UK businesses are small and medium sized. And those in city centres in particular can be really struggling at the moment while footfall remains low. This is a particular issue for the part of the uh, city which I'm currently sitting in, the part of London that I'm currently sitting in. The big businesses here are absolutely thriving. They're doing their work uh, from uh, um, uh, remotely from, from home. But the small supporting businesses need to see more people back at their desks uh, in, order to, uh, in order to return to um, uh, profitability and growth. And firms in the city are gradually seeing an increase in the numbers of workers returning to the office. Clearly that has to be done in a way which is safe and in line with government guidance. Uh, but what would be tremendously helpful would be to see support in making clear to people uh, how it is safe to return to the workplace and encouraging people to do that. So support from government for that message return to the um, office um, and clarity around guidance on what is uh, safe uh, would be uh, really really helpful. We do find sometimes uh, that positions either change very quickly and one understands that this is a dynamic situation with the virus um, uh, or, that, or that the advice that's coming out isn't as clear as it might be. So a, a call for a support for returning footfall, uh, but also clarity uh, around um, uh, messaging and safety. And I really would just stress again uh, the particular challenge faced by the centre, the centre of London, and I think the centre of other cities um, as well. Um, we've seen some uh, uh, some very successful um, uh, uh, more local developments, a growth in the 15 minute uh, economy um, and um, you know, much more local activity, but this isn't really helping uh, the, the central activity zone in London where we need international footfall, where we need uh, tourist footfall, where we need business footfall um, uh, to, uh, to, you know, for the businesses there to thrive. This is actually a question not just of um, reinventing how those areas work but I think we do need to remember what the strengths of those areas bring to the country as a whole. Uh, moving away from my financial um, uh, link for the moment let's think uh, uh, for a second about the uh, arts sector where the West End is so absolutely critical. So that was my first uh, main area re uh, returning footfall where it's safe to do so. Secondly um, I'd like to just come on to some of the uh, challenges that some of our businesses are going to face as the government support schemes come to an end. This could really be a cliff edge for the economy. Uh, yes of course the support schemes have to end at some point uh, but of course thought needs to be given to whether they should stop suddenly or be tailed off. Um, let's keep in mind, for example, that government loan schemes such as the bounce back loan scheme and coronavirus business interruption loan scheme are due to begin repayment in March 2021. 
they've been really helpful, but the build-up of debt is going to have a big impact. The City UK, a cross-sectoral body representing um, our sector, uh, predicts that one-third of the two million businesses that have received support, one-third of the businesses that have received support, may be unable to service that debt, which could leave three million jobs at risk. The financial services industry is well placed to help the government tackle this debt. And to that end, the City Corporation has been involved in a project led by City UK and EY that brought together 200 financial experts from 50 financial and professional services firms. They recommended a new government-backed entity, a UK recovery corporation, which would put the debt on, a more, ma on more manageable terms and provide a vehicle for future private investment. And as a result, the UK is the first country to have an advanced plan for recapitalisation. But with this potential debt crisis, a problem that, uh, this potential debt crisis, a looming problem for the economy, um, we do need government help, and we, it would, uh, you know, the government should give serious consideration to implementing this plan. And then, very finally and very briefly, uh, the other cliff edge that's looming, if no deal is agreed, uh, uh, the, the other cliff edge looming is the situation if no deal is agreed by the end of the transition period uh, uh, with the European Union uh, uh, at the end of the year. And uh, uh, um, there is a very real risk that if a deal is not agreed, uh, the growth and recovery from COVID that we're beginning to see could be hampered. So it's essential, I, uh, uh, I suggest, that efforts are redoubled to find the best possible solution to avoid uh, an outcome that would damage our economy. So it's been an enormous achievement that many sectors and many businesses have continued largely as usual through this pandemic. That has really demonstrated the strength of um, uh, many sectors. It's uh, remarkable resilience, which will play a real role in business recovery across the capital and the nation as we go forward. And uh, to continue this role, both in our own work and as the corporation's contribution to the important work of the London Recovery Board, uh, we will be publishing a report in October to look at how the city can remain competitive as a global financial centre over the coming years. But it's the fundamental strengths of London that are going to help us recover and rebuild together with the strengths of other parts of the country, uh, as we've done before, and I am very confident. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Catherine. Some, uh, some great opening remarks there. And I think one of the really interesting things that came out of your comments from my perspective is the, the relationship between London and the rest of the country. And you know, the levelling up agenda has been a very important one for this government. It's put a lot of emphasis on it. I think a lot of us feel, self-included, that it has to be, and you know, the clues in the language, it has to be London and the rest of the country, not London or the rest of the country. Um, and I think that's more important than ever off the back of uh, the response to this pandemic. Um, I'm sure our next speaker is going to agree with that because Paul Scully is, as well as being the, the Minister for Small Business, also the Minister for London. Um, he's an MP for Sutton and Cheam. And of course, before he was in politics, was the owner of many small businesses himself. So. Paul, some uh, gnarly issues that Catherine presented, if you want to cover some of those and, and wide remarks as well, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And there was a couple of bits right at the end there that I wanted to, to lead into. First of all, you talked about how uh, it's not London or the rest of the country. It's very much London and the rest of the country. You know, I've been uh, working in London to, as Catherine said, get the central activity zone um, up and running, like the many uh, uh, cities around uh, the country and indeed Europe that are having similar issues, but London is particularly large, as you can imagine. And the West End itself, uh, before we even get to the city, the West End itself represents 3% of the entire UK economy. So we have specific issues in London, but it's important that we do um, first of all, work out what levelling up means with, with the London context. I was in Battersea Power Station before lockdown and the mixed use regeneration there by steel from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Liverpool. It paints uh, a lot of material in the Midlands. It gets bricks from Gloucestershire, creates job opportunities around the world as we're getting people into electric cabs, black cabs in London and protecting the black cab iconic black cab, they're made in Coventry. There's 2,000 jobs there. So it's important that we do look at set London in the UK context, as well as that global world city. But as we look to recover, it's really important, as Catherine says, to remind ourselves of the, uh, the fundamentals of the UK economy, which are, which are pretty sound. And there's lots to, to celebrate that as we um, adjust and pivot out of this uh, the pandemic scenario, that we remind the, um, the investors that were flooding into the UK before why 
the, the UK is a fantastic place to invest. The fact that we've got a highly educated workforce, flexible uh, labour markets, uh, and we are open to foreign uh, direct investment. We've cut corporation tax down uh, as well to the lowest rate of the G20. Um, and the fact that we're top of the, the top of the class internationally of financial and professional services, we lead the world in uh, fintech and digital and many cultural uh, um, a set of parts of the um, economy as well. So the Chancellor, when we went into the, uh, the, the pandemic, really looked to react quickly uh, and wrap, we wrapped our arms around the economy. Everything that we put in uh, was to help as many people as we could, as many sectors as we could, as quickly as we could. And for me, as Nick said, I've been running small businesses before I was elected. Uh, becoming a minister at this particular time. I'm guessing this is effectively government as um, working in real time, as close as it's ever going to get to working in real time. The, the agility that the government has had to show in so many of the issues uh, that it's faced, remembering that the government, uh, the first priority of the government is to save lives, but restoring livelihoods, protecting jobs, protecting businesses, protecting sectors, is so, so important for the long term to make sure that we can bounce back as well. So the, the, the fundamental business support that we have, the manifesto commitment of this government was such that uh, we wanted to make sure that the UK was the best place to start and grow a business. I want to go further than that. I want to make sure that it doesn't matter where in the UK, whether it is in London or one of the cities, whether it's in a rural area, a coastal area, uh, it, you should be able to get access to finance, you should be able to get uh, great business support, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks and, and, and mentoring, all so, so important uh, for, uh, for, for developing businesses as well. But government, as I think the, 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 um, the crux of this day uh, suggests, has a, has a role to play, clearly, but it doesn't, beyond the key infrastructure projects that we're trying to accelerate, doesn't create jobs in itself. It's the private sector that's going to be the, uh, the source of the recovery. And in particular, uh, small businesses, which uh, represent uh, such a huge proportion of our economy. So does government actually just get out of the way or does it create the atmosphere? I think this is the, uh, for, for, for that recovery. And the, there is a nuance there that we've got to get right. Um, and we'll see um, the, the, the Chancellor obviously looking at the, the, the various um, uh, ways that we can support sectors, that we can support job creation as the, uh, and, as the support schemes come to an end. But we've, we've shifted now in terms of creating and building jobs. So that's why we're supporting apprenticeships, giving businesses the £2,000 bonus for every uh, 16 to 24 year old that they take on and £1,500 if it, an apprentice is over 25. We're trying to make sure that we can retain the, uh, the gains that we've made in protecting the economy through uh, the job retention bonus scheme. So paying businesses a thousand pounds for every um, person they're bringing back from furlough and keeping on their books until at least the end of January, because we want to make sure that there is no cliff edge in jobs as best we can. Knowing though, that obviously the redundancy figures and job losses are there, we're, we're seeing that and that's so regrettable, but we want to make sure that we can minimize that. So to give businesses the time to be able to pivot and, uh, and adjust. And I think this, is, uh, this then comes to what Catherine was saying about city centres. And as I said, London is a, has a particular inertia because it's three times the size of the next uh, biggest city in Europe, never mind the UK. And so we know that public transport is key in, in, in regaining people's confidence to come back to their workplace. I don't say they're returning to work because many, many people have been working incredibly hard over this period and in many, many cases more intensely, you can skip off one Zoom call or Teams call onto another within a matter of minutes. Uh, and I remember having to actually apologize to someone uh, for being two minutes early to a meeting. Mm -hmm. I thought, crikey, that's a, quite an adjustment in our thinking when, when that sort of thing ha that's, happens. But nonetheless, therefore, digital take up has been accelerated. Flexible working that we were looking for as a conservative government anyway through the employment bill that's gonna be coming up has been accelerated. But flexible working is different from permanent working at home. Mm. Frankly, permanent working at home risks becoming mm. living at work. Uh, I say that for someone who's run small businesses set up around my kitchen table. I've worked from home, I've worked from uh, sites, I've worked from clients' uh, properties, I've worked from offices. Uh, and it, it is a mixture, it is the flexibility uh, that, that is um, there to be, to be had. But as Catherine said, we've got to make sure we don't hollow out our great cities 
in doing so. Big businesses that are not necessarily encouraging their employers, employees to come back to the workplace, as well as um, allowing young people to miss out on networking opportunities and career um, uh, progression development um, opportunities. They shouldn't expect to come back to, say, for example, a London, the London that they left, because theatres, big restaurants, all the places that make uh, our city so great can't live on fresh air. They thrive on people. And 80, we know that 80% of our uh, country's economy uh, is based on services. So what I would say is make sure that we can get that balance right. If I can support and we can support businesses um, develop and progress, yes, we will. But we need businesses to make sure that they're looking after each other, that business community. Our cities are ecosystems. You don't go to a hotel to just sleep in another bed. You go there because of the conference that you might be going to. So that's why we want to get conferences and events up and running when we can. We want to get the theatres up and running so you can come into that. But in London, I look out um, my window, there are restaurants, there are um, uh, museums already open that are, have worked so hard to give a safe and warm welcome. They're just waiting for you to come back. So there is a mixture of things that we can do. And I'm looking forward to the, the, the discussion, Nick, to see how more we can support business be the center of that recovery. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Great, great comments, really helpful. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Griffith. Um, Andrew is a former senior businessman himself, operating as, as CFO at Sky before duty called. Um, following Boris Johnson becoming prime minister, Andrew became his main business advisor in, in number 10 Downing Street. And then in last year's general election, he became the MP for Arundel and the South Downs. And he's one of the most respected voices on business within the Conservative Party. We're very lucky to have him here today. So, Andrew, over to you. Neat. Sorry, can you hear me now? Thank you, Nick. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and this is a very important uh, conference. It's also a great pleasure to follow my colleague, um, Paul Scully, who I have to say is a first class small business minister. Uh, there is no better choice. Uh, and he is, I know, doing a wonderful job. So we're, we're all in good hands. Um, and uh, the same is true of Catherine looking after the interests of the uh, City Corporation. Look, I'll be brief because um, it is, there's no point us all agreeing with each other, but, but private enterprise is absolutely fundamental to how we grow from here. I mean, if we're brutally honest, we're in a little bit of a hole, right? We've lost, uh, even after today's GDP growth figures, we've lost almost 12% of our economic output. If you, if you understand the fact that a large part of that GDP is actually funded by the state, it's state, state circular spending, the actual private sector economy is down by significantly more than that. So we have a great job of work to do and why it's really important that you've put today's panel together, Nick, and the, the work the CPS in doing this area is so very vital to all of our futures. The good news is that the private sector has had a very good pandemic. I mean, that sounds weird and take, please take that in context. But with the exception of one wobble about panic buying, our private sector supply chains have done a fantastic job, right? We've been well, been well fed, we've had our supplies, uh, we've been able to keep uh, board, our borders open um, and goods flowing around the world. And we shouldn't forget that because, you know, some parts of our um, state sector have been found wanting. Uh, they have found that the connective tissue isn't there. Uh, the private sector has actually done a very good job. Um, and there's a lesson for us all um, in, in how perhaps the state could do fewer things, but could do them better going forward. We shouldn't ignore that when we think about build back better. That's not just about greening the economy. It's also about that very large part of the economy in the United Kingdom that is, is consists of the state sector driving productivity and output improvements from that. I think the state has probably three, three roles to play. Uh, the first and most important, and I won't talk about it, is building confidence. You have to have confidence in the economy uh, and clearly there is more work to do on that. The second is certainty and linked with that is people deploying capital. And, and the government, again, has a really big role to play in providing that long-term certainty and that confidence to invest. Uh, whether it's the uh, ability of, of businesses to make a return on their investment, 
which is not just a mathematical equation. It's also about the regulatory environment in which we operate. It's about the confidence in the, the rule of law, which the UK is one of our great assets, uh, but it's not universal. And it's also about making sure that the state forms the right balance between the needs of consumers and having vibrant competitive sectors of the economy, but also allowing businesses to invest, to create infrastructure and make returns. And again, to be a little controversial, I'm not sure we've always got the balance of that right. I think in some cases we've outsourced some of those regulatory environments to arm's length regulators so that those very carefully tuned balances that perhaps ministers would be better equipped to make in a democratic society, we've now got being run by arm's length regulators, which drives a culture of risk aversion. And that can be fatal to the ability of capital to invest and make a long term a long term return. And then the third job is access to markets. Uh, I note today the breaking news that we seem to have reached a fantastic free trade agreement with Japan. Uh, that's just one brick in the wall uh, of building a post European Union international set of free trade agreements, which provides us with access to markets. And then fourth and finally, I think there is a role for uh, a modern state, a progressive state in being choiceful about those sectors in which it thinks in a hard headed way that we as an economy can really compete on the world stage. FinTech would be a brilliant example, the city of London but so would the emerging opportunity in green tech and hydrogen, uh, which I think could be as powerful to boost the economy as North Sea Oil was in the early 80s, which if you remember helped lift this country out of its post-industrial malaise. And there are other examples we could go on about life sciences, uh, about our role in artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and a lot of those are led out of the department for which uh, Paul is a minister. You clearly have to be hard-headed. I don't want to see um, the state crowd out private enterprise, but there is a legitimate role in a choiceful and sensible way, you know, informed by some of the best business minds that the UK is blessed with for us to make those choices. And if I'm again honest, I think some of those are hanging in the balance. I think we, we have the chance to be the leader in some of these emerging sectors, but, but we need to get up and get behind them now as we emerge because we've got a big mountain to climb in terms of getting this economy growing again uh, and creating the prosperity that we need to fund all those public services that we love and that we've furloughed and they're all working from home or not working at all there's this big big body of of the public sector that we've got to carry on our backs and it, it means that we've got to be really good um, and at our fighting weight from the fr free enterprise, the private enterprise side of the economy. Great, thanks very much, Andrew. I'm, I'm interested in this idea of um, the the sectors and the industries that uh, we, we think are gonna play a particularly prominent role in, in leading that recovery and also the implications of that for, for how far the state it might go and identify them and then support them. There's been, as you'll know, a lot of comment over the last few days about uh, UK state aid rules in the future. And just think about what a um, appropriate regime and set of rules and principles is to support those. Um, it's something maybe we'll, we'll come back to. Um, our final speaker uh, is one of the most preeminent entrepreneurs and businessmen of his generation, founding ICAP in his early 30s and growing it into an organisation worth billions of pounds. Um, he's now a director and an investor in various companies, and we're lucky enough to have him as our chair here at the Centre for Policy Studies. So over to you, Lord Michael Spencer. Um, Nick, thank you very much indeed, and uh, I am thrilled to be involved in this conference today. Uh, the subject matter is critical um, for, for all of us, for the country. We have got, we've gone through the worst recession ever in history, actually, um, <clears throat> certainly in modern history. <clears throat> and, um, and although obviously the statistics last month were positive, we're a long way from getting back to where we were beforehand. We want to do everything we can to have a V-shaped recovery, and more than a V-shaped recovery, really, because this is a, 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 you know, a sentinel moment in the history of the UK, not just the recovery from COVID, but also leaving the EU. We, you know, the decision to leave the EU, uh, controversial with many, 
is, uh, was taken, but obviously one of, the great, one of the great core reasons for leaving the EU is that the, the, the country can begin to make some very big decisions about what kind of country we are, what kind of economy we want, unfettered by EU regulations. And uh, it's important that we think of all of these issues together, to what the ideology of UK PLC um, looks like in the post-COVID, post-EU uh, world. Um, and I think the starting point to me as a businessman entrepreneur is that if we want to get growth going in this country, if we really want to sit supercharged, you, we, we need capital investment. Um, we need capital inflow from internationally into the UK, and we need domestic investors to deploy their capital. And I think, um, I would say absolutely at the outset, I think some of the suggestions of tax rises that may be imminent in the forthcoming budget in November, uh, particular capital taxes will be deeply damaging to that process. Of course, I understand the argument that um, COVID has increased the national debt very, very dramatically. Uh, GDP, sorry, national debt as a percentage of GDP is now up to uh, levels that were only seen during the, you know, after the last war. Um, and therefore, it looks at one blush that our balance sheet is very stretched. If you, however, factor in that we have record all-time low interest rates at the moment, not just in the UK, but globally. And by the way, um, I've spent my entire career in financial markets. That environment is not about to change soon. The actual cost of servicing our debt as a percentage of GDP is nowhere near the red zone at the moment. That doesn't mean to say that we can be oblivious to our debt, but I'm saying it, 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 you need to look at the stats before you, you, you get into any panic. And I, I think the, the, the threat of an increase in corporation tax um, and also capital gains tax would be profoundly damaging to the growth of the, this country. Um, we've had great success in the UK, as we know, over the past 10 years in slowly reducing um, corporation tax and seeing considerably increased inward investment into the country. Um, and indeed, oddly enough, the Laffer curve works. Our, receipt, our receipts from corporation tax have gone up in that period. The reality is that taxation does impact behavior and lower taxes do not, sorry, lower taxes often result in increased income. And no finer example on the issue of corporation tax exists, um, if you were ever to debate this, than to wonder why it is that Ireland, not exactly the largest company in Europe, has the Ireland's revenue from multinationals that are, don't use Ireland as their European headquarters, their tax revenue is greater than the aggregate tax of every other European country put together. And that is achieved for one very simple reason. Ireland has a more attractive corporation tax rate. So in my opinion, although at, at, a, at a certain level, increasing corporation tax, it certainly polls well, Obviously, these things poll well because people would prefer that increases in taxation are applied elsewhere rather than to themselves, uh, which is a perfectly normal human reaction. But the reality is that any increase in corporation tax will reduce capital inflow into the UK, which will reduce growth in this country over time. And if we are here to maximize the growth of our economy, in my opinion, we will be extremely foolhardy and short term and lacking courage to increase corporation tax at this moment. And the same goes for capital gains tax. You know, I started a business um, some years ago now, admittedly, um, with uh, three colleagues and 50,000 pounds of my own money. We never subsequently raised one penny of cash uh, from external investors. And 20 years after that, we were a FTSE 100 company. If in launching that business, I was looking at a potential capital gains tax rate of approaching 50%, which is what is suggested in some quarters may happy if it happen if it's moved up to the top rate of income tax. I profoundly doubt I would have started that company in the UK. And I tell you this as well, that if we do increase CGT significantly, inward investment in the UK, um, that it comes under the CGT umbrella, will result in a real dramatically adverse change in, in investor attitudes. And albeit that there will be a cry that um, um, that these taxes are only temporary, the real truth of the matter is the government's track record of saying taxes are temporary and they prove rather more permanent means that no investors will trust this at all. So I, I, I put it to you and I put it to the audience today that 
um, um, this, this, this is a time when our government has to make brave choices, and I'm not pretending that they are easy, but increasing capital taxes would be absolute madness, in my opinion, if we are going to maximize the growth rate of our economy. And there is only one way forward to get out of our fiscal crisis in the long run, which is to increase our economic growth. So that is a cornerstone of what I recommend we consider. Um, there is another issue that was touched upon, well, not touched upon, mentioned at some length by Andrew. Um, I agree with Andrew on many things, but on this, I'm afraid I do not, which is I think the issue of state aid um, is, uh, is a popular one. Um, and it is tempting to think that, um, um, that there are technologies or industries that the government should provide support to. And indeed, you mentioned fin financial technology. Um, actually, that's where my business was based, to be honest with you. Um, I have to tell you the success of our company was not assisted by the government in any way at all. Um, um, not that that bothered me, by the way. I preferred the government to keep out of my life, to be absolutely honest with you. Uh, uh, the, the less government, in, if you run a business, the happier you are. Um, the problem with state aid is that bluntly the track record of governments making the right decisions is appalling. Um, um, it becomes a, a politicized issue. Decisions are made because people want to support something in a particular region. And the, the, the real truth is that governments are ill qualified to do this. And incidentally, the great companies that have emerged in the world in the past um, past 20 years or so that have transformed the global economy, the, you know, the, the, we know them, you know, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, not none of these were achieved by government uh, assistance or state aid. They were achieved by individual entrepreneurs with vision and courage and capital support and an investor appetite for their businesses. And so I really think the, the best way to achieve growth and success in our country is to um, encourage the, the level of entrepreneurship we have in the UK at the moment is greater than it's ever been in post-war history. Arguably, I'd said as great as it's been since, since the 19th century. Um, this is a result in the long-term result of a lot of the Thatcher reforms. We want to continue with that environment of un encouraging entrepreneurship and encouraging innovation. And there is plenty of it. But I tell you what, if we go around to an environment where the state is trying to direct where money goes and where capital taxes are increased, that, that advantage that we have will evaporate very, very, very quickly. Um, and I believe that fervently. One last small point I would make as well, if I, before I hand back, um, it, uh, just a suggestion. I mean, quarantine is a controversial issue. I appreciate how, it, you know, which countries are put into quarantine and not. I'm a bit more libertarian. I think we should do less of it, but we are where we are. But one thing I really would suggest is why on earth, if people are quarantined, they're not able, let's say three or four days after their return to the UK in quarantine to go and get a COVID test. And uh, we apparently seem to trust other COVID tests, which we do domestically, why we wouldn't allow that to happen, would open up the UK to business travel. I built an international business at one point. I had 63 offices around the world. Funnily enough, I traveled rather a lot. Actually, my job isn't quite like that anymore. But where I running that business and I was unable to travel, uh, it would have been severely negatively impacted. So I think we need to show flexibility on issues like that. Enough from me. Nick, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I thought I thought there was a risk that we might all be in violent agreement with each other on, on lots of these issues, and I suspect we are deep down. But uh, thank you for providing some some very useful challenges. Um, given we have a, a government minister on the on the panel, I think it'd be remiss not to come to Paul first um, on on a couple of I think really important agenda items, which um, first Catherine and then and then Michael brought up. The first of those, I think, is the, this idea about recapitalization and, and the debt pile that lots of uh, businesses are going to be landed with for often reasons which have nothing to do with them doing. The fact that the government um, made a set of choices which basically put the economy on hold, uh, forced a lot of those companies to take on debt, um, and they willingly did so, but it's going to be very hard for them to deal with that debt. So, Paul, if, if you would, I'd love some reflections from you on, on how you think those businesses might best deal with that and the recapitalization proposals in particular. But secondly, um, again for you Paul, Andrew and Michael have both talked about the importance of this uh, invest, investment uh, climate, if you like, how we can make sure that the UK continues to be seen as a destination worthy of capital being deployed in. 
Um, and there were very specific issues just raised by Michael around, around the tax environment which businesses face. So if, if I could, I'd just ask you, Porter, some brief remarks on those two issues. Yeah, no, absolutely, Nick. And um, thanks very much. Really um, uh, interesting, fascinating points by by all uh, uh, the panelists there. Um, in terms of the the, the, the debt part, uh, look, I think as you say, Nick, uh, and as I said in my introductory remarks, we moved really, really quickly to to make sure that uh, businesses could get what they absolutely needed at that time, which was cash flow, uh, certainty of cash flow. So it's so important to to work through. The grants for the smaller businesses, the retail, leisure, hospitality, and small businesses, uh, but importantly, that um, the access to finance that we were struggling to get out, which is why we had to tinker a few times in response to what business was telling us about the C bills uh, loan. We had to uh, bring in the CL bills loan, etc. And then finally, the bounce back loan was the one for smaller companies, anyway, that really hit home, that was popular. Uh, that was easy to get out the door, that was uh, on, on good terms for those businesses who then uh, felt more comfortable in having an appetite to, to, to take on some, uh, some, some, uh, some finance. But, uh, but you're right, I think we, are, we do know that that means that, um, that uh, um, businesses are going to come to a point where the 12 month holiday, for example, the bounce back loan comes to an end and they've got to start paying it back. We've tried to limit that interest rate. I've seen Catherine's um, recapitalization strategy, and I think it's important we'll take, you know, certainly reflect on that and take that on board because we do need to uh, um, to work with businesses to 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 to, to get through this process. Um, in terms of inward investment, um, I talked about the fundamentals of the UK economy. I talked about the fact that uh, we need places like London, which, as I say, is not in isolation but is a, a showcase for the rest of the world. Um, and uh, to to make sure that when de international uh, tourism comes back, for example, we're ready for them. We haven't hollowed out the city, but we must also uh, make sure that we can uh, show not only that we've got all those fundamentals in place, but that we are absolutely open for that inward investment, as we have been for many, many years. It's no accident that actually we were... Um, uh, you know, one of the top three countries for inward investment before the pandemic um, came in. And um, as Michael's talked about tax, look, I'm, I, I'm a very big tax, tax simplifier myself. Uh, you know, we've got a huge tax code. I don't really want to make it any longer, um, frankly. Uh, I, I'm very much a, I was asked yesterday on another panel, my political hero, and I, I was starting to go down the line of Margaret Thatcher, but then I looked at Ronald Reagan, who um, worked in partnership uh, with her, um, and changing the economy uh, of the global economy over the 80s. And the, I always remember his top, uh, worst nine words in the English language, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. Um, so this is why government can help shape, it can help nudge, as Andrew was talking about, but ultimately it's businesses that, uh, that need to um, uh, be freed up to, to, to uh, uh, fuel the recovery. And so that's why I'm believing simpler. Uh, simplified tax system. And I know the Chancellor, the Prime Minister's talked about no more, no austerity, 2.0. The Chancellor has talked about um, no huge tax uh, rises, but we've just got to find a balance. We've got to find a fact that the furlough scheme and the, all the support costs 160 billion quid. That's more than the, um, in six months or so of spend, that's more than we spent on the NHS by some way in an entire year. But as Michael said, there are more than one ways of skinning a cat in terms of um, paying down that debt. Thanks, Paul. Um, Andrew, I'd be really interested in, in your reflections on that, that tax point and uh, some of the points that Michael was making around the Laffer curve. And you know, one, one of the very interesting uh, dynamics that struck me off the back of the stamp duty cut was just the injection of activity that that's led to and the fact that suddenly we've got you know, property market absolutely booming again. And it shows that if, if taxes are put in a, in a proportionate way and cut in the right sort of places, it can lead to a lot of that economic activity. So be very, very, very grateful for your comments and reflections on that. And then also, if you would perhaps you could expand a bit upon uh, your idea of prioritising certain sectors and certain areas and, and where the limits are in terms of what the state can and should do there, particularly in terms of financial support and state aid. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, I just associate myself with the comments from Michael on tax um, that, that I fully support that. I mean, one of the uh, the things that 
I came into politics to try and do is remove friction on businesses. That's how you build a strong private enterprise economy um, and the tax is a point of friction. Um, I've always made the point, it's about two things actually, and I saw this on the other side of the table. It is about the rate, and, and in some cases we're competitive and in some cases we're not, but as much about the rate, it's also about the simplicity of administration. So the UK ranks about seventh in the world for competitiveness of tax rates, and it's about 27th in the world for ease of paying your taxes. So that goes a little bit to my, not quite Whitehall reform point, um, but, but there's a big role in terms of how the state can get better. Uh, and actually to give them credit, I think we would all say um, that some of those direct interventions that HMRC put in place at a much faster rate than anyone ever said they could, um, and, and must have taken a lot of challenge and pushing to get them to that point, um, have worked pretty well. So I think we should be encouraged a little bit that there are big benefits if we can make that side of things more productive and close that gap between where the rates sit and where the ease of administration sit. I think Michael has done me an enormous disservice. Um, you use the word state aid, Nick. I did not use the word state aid. Um, the sort of support I want to see for some of those high growth industries is actually exactly the sort of support that allowed Michael to be so successful in his business, which is actually removing impediments. I, I contend without knowing the detail of Michael's brilliant success, that if it wasn't for things like deregulating capital controls and deregulating the market and the big bang uh, and all of that, that, that that business may not have come into fruition. Uh, and so my analogy for these sectors is actually to try and hack through some of the thicket of regulation um, that prevents them achieving takeoff velocity. That's all I mean. So if, if we looked at, uh, I'll pick an example I know a little bit about, but if we looked at hydrogen, um, perfectly possible to make an excellent hydrogen car. Um, but some of the regulations that have been written don't really make provision for that. Uh, they make provision for electric cars, which are zero emission, but those same regulations don't make provision for hydrogen, green hydrogen, which is even, even a better source of fuel. And actually without some of the geopolitical difficulties of solid state batteries where the rare earths come from, you know, a mostly Chinese dominated supply chain. By the way, I'm pretty positive on trading with China, don't get me wrong, um, but it it's clearly seems to me it's better to have two dogs in that, in that particular hunt. Um, similarly to some of the way in which drug trials are regulated. You know, we have potentially one of the most competitive life sciences industries in the world. It's a huge generator of tax and uh, it's exactly the provider of the sort of high end skilled scientific jobs that we want uh, in, our, in our country. But it's a global competitive market. Every other country sees precisely the same opportunity. Uh, and so we need to be able to compete in terms of access to a modern data uh, regulatory environment um, and make sure that we're not putting overburdens in place from our socialized healthcare system so that our drugs companies can be fully competitive and make the most of the opportunity. So it's not about um, where you put public money. Uh, we do anyway uh, put a vast amount of public money to work. I would argue we probably spread it a little bit thin uh, things like UKRI, uh, the government is spending on, on science and research. Um, it's already doing that. Every single day, it is spending pounds of our taxpayers' money in placing lots of small bets. And I think, as, a, as someone experienced in business, that it's much better to place fewer, bigger bets, align them with the scale of the opportunity, so it's not just spray and pray, but you actually have a sense of what good looks like and you're getting behind and rotating that money from what's often a sort of slightly legacy and archaic way of allocating it into a more choiceful way um, against the sort of outcomes you expect. Uh, and then being hard on yourself, you know, if that's not coming to fruition, if we're not delivering the growth that we need, then reallocate that to, uh, to areas that we do. Thanks, Andrew. I suspect we are now back in uh, violent agreement with each other territory, <laughs> but we're good to cross the bridge. Um, Catherine, your, your um, roles and responsibilities, thinking about different bits of the financial services industry, and in particular, I suppose, fintech, which is sort of seen as a, a, 
champion, national champion. We are fintech capital of the world. Be interested in your reflections on uh, this idea of sort of highlighting and prioritizing certain sectors in particular and, and wider reflections on this this idea of picking winners if you like yeah well i think it's a very very interesting um, suggestion and i do uh, think that andrew's point just now that there are a raft of measures which government can take to support sectors uh, beyond uh, um, uh, simple state aid uh, uh, is, is a really key one. Um, looking at fintech, we do think that it's one of our great strengths, but we can't rest on all our laws. We have been leading the world with our regulatory approach, with uh, the innovation that's been happening here. We've been drawing people in from all over the place. But we've also seen a multiplicity of initiatives to support that sector. And I think it's, I, 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 we think it's very timely to have a review of what has been working well in that sector and what we could do to help it work even better for the future. And that's why we've been, uh, we are supporting a sector-led uh, review, um, led by um, you know, people, uh, experts from the sector, not not, uh, not by government, uh, for Treasury on 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 that. Be led by uh, Ron Khalifa, be reporting in uh, to Treasury uh, and Innovate Finance, which is the sector uh, body, will be um, supporting it. Um, I think there is a great deal to argue for taking a sector like this, where there are wide strengths across the UK, there are pockets of expertise in many different uh, cities, because it's much wider than a simple, um, uh, you know, we talk about fintech, but actually there's a whole raft of things that come into that. Uh, so strengths across the UK and strengths in the concomitant challenges of cyber um, attack and so on uh, that we can really build on as we look to the future and taking something like that and looking collectively at it and what might work and enable um, entrepreneurs to do more of what they do well i think could, is a really good way forward thanks Catherine. um i'd like to just use the last 10 minutes or so of this session just to take some of the many questions that have been coming through um both from the youtube channel and, and from our twitter feed and just a reminder for anybody who's watching please submit questions via YouTube or, or on our Twitter feed at CPS Think Tank. Um, and the first of those questions, and I'd like to put this to you if I may, Michael, is, is about the um, some of the trends that have come off the back of dealing with the pandemic and the fact that a lot of people are working from home. And, and different people have talked about getting back to the workplace as opposed to getting back to work. We all accept that a lot of people have been working very hard. But the question is really about whether or not working from home might be a growth opportunity. Um, the fact that people can save money, they've got more time for family and for leisure. And if they're just as productive in the workplace, do we really need to go back to the way before? Because isn't this sort of creative destruction, adaptation, exactly what um, business thrives on? And perhaps some businesses will just have to fall by the wayside and other businesses will emerge. So is this emphasis on getting back to the workplace really something that the government should be prioritising as hard as it is? Uh, by the way, our, our work environment will change permanently as a result of the, the, the pandemic. Um, but I don't think there is a, 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 a sort of a one unitary solution that is the right one. Um, um, and admittedly, I, I, I built my career from the old world, you know, meeting people face to face was how my business was built. Whereas now, um, we meeting takes place more and more often. Obviously, the environment that we've got today, I mean, this I wouldn't have contemplated a conference like this as being a very realistic proposition 10 years ago. Um, but nevertheless, before we dismiss the value of the workplace, um, or we, we shouldn't, I think there's some very, very important values about the workplace. Um, of course, working at home saves your commute, saves the economy, you know, mind you, it doesn't do much for landlords and it doesn't do very much for the people who own the restaurants locally or the dry cleaners. Um, but of course, there are some there are some advantages in working from home. But equally, there are huge advantages in in the social environment of working in an office together. The exchange of ideas, um, the ability to walk into somebody's office and ask them questions. How do the by the way the young generation when they start a new job learn about the interaction with people? You know, business is about humanity as well. So I, I think I think there will clearly be changes going forward in workplace practices. Technology has obviously enabled us uh, powerfully in this new world, but let's not forget the huge value of um, the, the, what the workplace, the work environment brings in terms of education, culture. By the way, how do you build a corporate culture within a firm if, if people don't meet? So uh, I'm, in, I'm, I'm keen to get my staff in my small business now uh, back to work as much as possible. 
Nick, can I just come in there? Just I know you want you push for time because I could talk for hours about it, but I clearly won't. But there's one thing which sums up Michael's uh, point, and I think there's some other points that people make, and it's the fact that although this is seen as liberating, and it is in many examples, there's also an element of being curated, because as Michael said, when we are on Zoom calls, team calls, someone's put that team to that those people together. So um, we, so you, you lose out on some of the brush by meetings, the chance meetings, as Michael said, if you are a junior in an office, you see other people more experienced than you working, you lose out on that. So there is that balance. That's what I meant about the flexible working and permanent working from home being slightly different. And, and actually, we're hearing very much these messages from the businesses that we talk to. Yes, there are some advantages to having a flexible workforce with people working from home part of the time, but there will always be a need to bring people together, to share expertise, to share chat. This is very two-dimensional, and one needs that uh, more nuanced approach that you only get by bringing people into one place. And I must say, I've been really pleased to get back, uh, uh, to, back to get back here and uh, yeah, to, to, to see people in, in the flesh. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, if I may, I mean, first of all, I, f I feel enormously for young people because that's really where this bites, if, if, if we're truthful. Um, their opportunities to train, sometimes their opportunities to get that first step on the work ladder. I, I actually think it's also a little bit bigger. This is a question about our cities, and, and this is a big, profound thing that we as a society have to ask. Uh, it's particularly acute in London. If you look at the difference between continental European cities, and I think the mayor has quite a lot to answer for. You know, we've got a city where there's too much crime and there was too much crime going into this. There is too much congestion. We have less bridge capacity crossing the Thames than we had in the 19, early 19th century. And now we're aiding and abetting that by closing roads. So there is a policy piece to this as, as well. Um, and, and we've got to have a proper conversation um, about the role of our great cities. Um, I think they, uh, you know, London is a world city. It is fundamental to our economy that we get London to work. It doesn't mean it has to work in exactly the same way it did in February 2020, but we need a vision for London. London needs a renaissance. I would like to see London become much more of a live work city, um, like some of the other uh, great cities of the world. Um, but we, we, we need to, it's probably a separate conference on a separate day, Nick, um, but we do need to have that conversation quite urgently now. Um, and, and obviously, you know, slightly partisanly, um, I do think there is a failure of leadership very sadly there. I, I can't resist um, just asking Catherine some reflections on that. I mean, based where you are right in the city of London and the, the sort of the issues that have arisen on transport uh, in particular over the last few months just seem to be clogging up the city at a time where you would have thought we'd be trying to do the exact opposite. So perhaps I'll just ask you to comment briefly. So that's a very complicated question. Um, I, first of all, I would say that our transport system is an absolutely vital part of our uh, infrastructure. It's as vital to, to London as um, uh, you know, water or anything else. Uh, it has been facing particular challenges. Um, it, it can't, it, while social distancing continues, it can't operate at uh, full uh, anywhere near full capacity. Uh, while lack of confidence and concern amongst the general uh, uh, you know, travelling community continues, uh, it isn't even, I think, fully using the capacity that there is. Um, we had a very congested city going into this. We actually believe that moving to uh, a more um, uh, uh, a mixed method of transport is actually going to be important for freeing up our streets. Unapologetically, the city has a, um, a very forward-looking approach to making more space for pedestrians and cyclists to ease some of the congestion that we were seeing. I think that really does uh, need to um, uh, continue. Um, uh, because we just don't have the space for all the cars that want to pour through. We need to encourage people and deliveries onto different modes. Um, and finally, I think I don't want to stray into the political. I would just say that over the last few months, I've seen London come together, London government at all different uh, levels, come together to work together, cross party, uh, um, uh, in a way which I think is unique. And I think that's something to be, um, to be celebrated. We've got some big challenges ahead, uh, but let's hope that that uh, connected working uh, continues. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, we are sort of down to our last 30 seconds or so, but I'd, I'd love to just ask Michael to come in very quickly, um, both with any sort of concluding comments he, he might have, but also, uh, and you're not going to be able to do this in the 12 seconds, I'm going to leave you, Michael, but 
Um, if you could just sort of briefly comment on this, this balance between London on the one hand and the levelling up agenda, which is so central to this government's mission, and, and where you see the, um, the balance being between those two things. So I don't, I don't think they're mutually incompatible. The, um, if at the end of the day, levelling up, expanding economic growth to the north of England and the other, the other extended parts of the UK, not just the north either, by the way, um, can really only be done by ex uh, expanding economic growth. And we should do everything we can to, to make sure that the UK maintains a position of we are focused on being a highly competitive economy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And thank you so much to, to all the panellists. Again, thanks so much to Catherine and City London Corporation for supporting this and making it happen. Um, as ever, you, one fails to get through all the questions that are coming through. So sorry if you put something forward and, and we did not talk about it today. But thanks so much. I think, you know, all in agreement that the private sector has got a huge role to play. The question is about where the government can best target its help, target its support, and where the balance lies between um, helping certain sectors and just getting out of the bloody way. And the CPS will always be firmly in the, the latter category, I think. But thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and thanks to all the panellists.